Hi, welcome to Blogging Heads TV. My name is Arya cohen Wade, and I'm your host on Culturally Determined. And my guest today is Elizabeth Nolan Brown. Uh, could you introduce yourself, please? Hi, uh, I'm Elizabeth. I'm an associate editor at Reason Magazine and also the co-founder of Feminists for Liberty. Uh, thanks so much for coming on today. So you've been writing a lot lately about an issue that's kind of flown under the radar for most people, I would suspect, but in other circles, it's uh, become a issue of great concern. And that's the recent passage of a piece of legislation uh, that whose acronym is FOSTA. It was combined with a other piece of legislation known as SESTA. So you may have seen those things uh, talked about on Twitter. Um, could you, for people who don't even know what this is at all, could you kind of give some background? Sure. Uh, so it's a bill that just passed uh, Congress in late February and in March, and President Trump just signed it into law yesterday. Um, basically, it's been misleadingly sort of sold as a way to fight sex trafficking and a way to hold um, sites like Backpage accountable for sex trafficking. And um, it amends uh, the Communications Decency Act, which is sort of uh, – passed in the 90s, sort of the foundational law of the, of the internet that we know it today, which says that websites cannot be treated like the speaker of content that users post. So anything from, you know, Facebook and Twitter to uh, any website that has comments, anything like that, they can't be in trouble for the things that their users post if, they're, if their users post illegal things. Uh, so what FOSTA does is two things. It amends Section 230 of this, of this communications act to say that websites can be held accountable if the illegal activity in question is sex trafficking or prostitution. Not, um, and it also says that anyone posting, um, anyone hosting any content that facilitates or promotes prostitution is guilty of a federal crime. Um, and so just real quick, I just want to say, you know, prostitution, generally when people say prostitution, they mean uh, you know, paid sexual activity between consenting adults. Sex trafficking refers to people who are either being forced into it or people who are underage that are, you know, so they can't legally consent. So when we talk about sex trafficking under federal law, that's what that is. But FOSTA doesn't just prevent, um, doesn't just have to do with sex trafficking. It has to do with prostitution in general. Right. So, um, so this Section 230 of uh, the Communications Decency Act Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that and how that has in some ways given us like the internet as we know it today? Yeah, it really has because, you know, if, uh, so to use an example from, from reason where I work, you know, uh, we got a couple, a couple years back, we got subpoenaed and various things, uh, because some of our commenters had made what federal prosecutors had thought was a threat against a judge. Um, it was it was clearly a sort of joke. It was referring to a line in Fargo about putting someone through a wood chipper. But anyways, uh, the prosecutors at first at least took that as a true threat and started investigating it. Um, I think they eventually decided it was not a true threat, so nobody got in trouble. But uh, had they decided that it had been, not and Section 230 didn't exist, not only would the person who made that threat be in trouble, but Reason Magazine could have been published too. Um because, you know, so much of it's our internet today from everything from all the social media that we know and love to uh, message boards and forums like Reddit and all of this. I mean, it's it's all built on users posting content without gatekeepers. Obviously, people try to um, do things to prevent explicitly illegal content. They have terms and services that say you can't post this and that, whatever. But, you know, short of having to hire way more people than any company could afford to, to manually filter to look monitor content or not letting anyone post anything that could be remotely controversial um you know this wouldn't work without section 230 so the new bill that they passed fasta it doesn't you know it doesn't get rid of section 230 altogether but it does get rid of it with with regard to certain crimes um which you know is a sort of something uh, legislators have been looking to do for a while is weaken Section 230. And so people are saying, you know, this weakening of it is just the first step, they think. Um, but even, you know, even if it doesn't, even if they don't carve out any exceptions for any other crimes, the fact that they've carved out this exception for prostitution and Section 230 not applying for that has already started to, we've already started to see all these major shifts in the way that um, social media companies and websites are handling content in, in the past two weeks since FOSTA has been passed because they're very worried now that they could be um, held legally liable for this stuff. Right, and we'll, we'll discuss a little bit more of that in a yeah, minute. Exactly. Um, so, so under 
current law, let's say that I use like Twitter to make a threat of violence against a public figure and um, Twitter doesn't take it down. Um, what is does under current law Twitter has no legal liability, or do they have a liability to like report that to the proper authorities? I mean, yeah, it's 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 all sort of iffy and it's all sort of different. Um, so Section two thirty does not prevent people from breaking federal laws, which is why there are certain things like um, child pornography and terrorism. Where it, where the, where, you know, you often see sites being held liable if they don't do everything possible to take it down. Now, that's not to say, I mean, obviously sometimes still, uh, you know, terrible things like child porn still get up on sites that, that do try to prevent it. And, you know, as long as, yes, as long as they make good faith efforts, it's, it's okay. But so it's, it's sort of a gray area. But it is, it is important to know that for these federal crimes, it doesn't apply. So what, what, what the change is now with FOSTA is that state attorneys generals can sue, can bring criminal charges, and people can sue in civil court. Um, and that's the major change. So right now, if you posted a threat to Twitter and someone was victimized by that threat somehow, um, right now they could not sue Twitter and say, I was victimized by your tweet and therefore I deserve money from Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, but now they can. Or, or now, you know, now without Section 230, they would be able to. Okay, so that you mean if Section 230 was eliminated entirely? Yeah, sorry, I realize that that doesn't apply to threats, but um, right. Yeah. Um, okay, so this has had some kind of surprisingly quick results. Um, usually, when le- when there's legislation uh, <laughs> coming from Washington, it's like you don't feel the effects immediately. But um, one of them, well, I don't know. You can tell me whether this is an actual link or people are just kind of conflating the things. The big, the most, the biggest one so far is that the feds shut down this website called backpage.com. Um, but that seems more like it was a pre-existing criminal case that they were investigating that um, is getting, is it conflated or is it just like this, this would have happened anyway if, if they had not changed their, you know, standard operating procedure in reaction to this new legislation. So yeah, that this is what everyone has been trying to say is that, if Backpage is knowingly facilitating sex trafficking, if there's evidence of that, and there's been a massive congressional investigation that was like a year and a half long, there's been all sorts of state investigations, if they were knowingly facilitating it, they could already be punished under um, under the uh, law that passed in 2015 called the SAVE Act. So we already have that where we could go after Backpage for knowingly facilitating sex trafficking, if they, if they did. Uh, the charges that were brought against Backpage are not under the SAVE Act. They are just money laundering and conspiracy and violations of the Travel Act. The Travel Act is a sort of old-timey act that says you can't use interstate commerce for uh, certain illegal activities, including prostitution. So the things that Backpage is actually indicted for are the same things we've seen um, all sorts of previous sites that involve prostitution and before the Internet, all sorts of prostitution rings in general being charged with. Um, it's it's not, yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with FOSTA, what they're being charged with. And why that's so key is because, you know, a lot of people were were telling legislators that. Um, there's also a court case in, in Massachusetts right now, a federal court case that Backpage is, um, is the defendant in. And that case could also, both that case and this federal thing could show that we don't need FOSTA in order to hold Backpage accountable um, if they are doing things wrong. And... So a lot of people, including the Department of Justice, even were saying, hey, don't pass this bill or at least don't pass it as is. Don't pass it yet. Let's wait a little bit longer because maybe we'll see that we don't need to radically overhaul Internet law that's been in effect for two decades in order to do these things that you're saying we need this law in order to do. And um, uh, Bob Goodlett in the Senate Judiciary Committee was, you know, had a big fuss about it and said he didn't want to pass it. And pretty much the House leadership, from from what I've heard from all sorts of sources, um, just said no. We're voting on this now. We're not going to let it go through another round of markups. We're not going to wait for this court case, which everyone thinks is going to come out in two weeks. We're not going to wait and see what the Justice Department is doing. We are passing this right now. And that's what's so messed up because, you know, a lot of people have said they clearly didn't. It seems as if Congress or certain people in Congress did not want to wait and have it be found out that have it be revealed that they didn't need to pass this in order to hold Backpage accountable. A, because that had been their whole premise all along, and then it would show their premise was false, and B, it might have, you know, derailed momentum to pass it, and I think that they really, really wanted to pass this bill regardless of what it does or doesn't do with regard to sex trafficking and prostitution or anything else, because they want to carve a hole in this foundational bit of internet law. Mm-hmm. So it, it passed pretty overwhelmingly, and uh, two there were two votes against it, 
in the Senate, Ron Wyden and Rand Paul. Um, and Ron, Ron Wyden, Wyden who authored Section 230, who, so he's like, right. This is his baby. Um, and then it passed, you know, in a bipartisan fashion, um, in the, in the House as well. Um, do you, well, here's, here's a question. Do you think that, I mean, are, are the people who are pushing for this operating in good faith and they're just, they just don't understand uh, the consequences as you see them, or do they want just a power grab over the internet? Uh, what do you, what do you think? Do they have, do you think they have some legitimate arguments? No, I don't think they have <laughs> any legitimate arguments. Um, I'm sure that some people are arguing in good faith, right? Um, you know, I'm sure that a lot of, like with so many, unfortunately, so many pieces of legislation, I'm sure some senators and representatives just, you know, know the bare minimum about it and say whatever. Um, But there was a lot of action from a a lot of different groups. I mean, from victims uh, advocacy groups, from sex worker rights groups, from civil liberties groups, from tech companies. Everybody um, had been hardcore lobbying, you know, all sorts of uh, legislators to about the the problems with this bill. So I think it's, it'd be, you know, it'd be impossible for them to have not, at least a lot of them to have not at least suspected that there were serious flaws with this bill. And I think, yeah, power grab is um, probably one explanation. Like I said, there are definitely some factions that really just wanted to want to get rid of section 230 to begin with. I mean, Kamala Harris, who's now in the Senate has been pushing for this for years and just like, just couldn't wait to get into the Senate and, and help destroy it. Also, though, I think the more simple explanation for the vast majority of people who voted for it is just that they don't want to be seen voting against a law that says stop sex traffickers. They don't want to be in an ad coming up in November or or next time that for election saying they voted against the stop sex traffickers bill. And like that's I mean, it's so cynical and sad, but I think that's basically what it comes down to is we're going to have this horrible consequences just because all of the people in Congress are a bunch of pansies to actually like, (laughs) you know. Um, Yeah, so. uh so the first place, the first time I had ever heard about Backpage was probably from a uh, Nicholas Kristoff column. He did a number of them over the years. Um, I'm not the type of person who goes to Backpage normally. Um, so that was, so, and he always talked about it as, as in terms of like underage sex trafficking. And he has written a lot about uh, sex trafficking internationally and the, the amount that's, you know, there's some amount that still happens in the United States. So what, um, what, what is your view of, of Backpage. Yeah, so I mean, Backpage is like like Craigslist. It's a it's a massive um, you know platform for adverts, classified ads that has all sorts of sections. So I mean, there's job ads and there's people selling their lawn mowers and people looking for babysitters and all sorts of stuff. It's not just a forum for adult advertising. Um, you know, se- uh, Craigslist used to have a, a forum for an adult section too, and the federal government pressured them into closing it down. And when that happened, a lot of sex workers uh, migrated over to Backpage and started advertising there. And then that's really when the federal government started scapegoating Backpage instead of Craigslist. Because if you look about 10 years ago, they were saying all the same things about Craigslist that they say now about Backpage. Um, So there's an adult section on Backpage and people can post in it. Um, It's got, you know, sections for people who are just looking to hook up with, uh, you know, kinky sex stuff, uh, not paid, not commercial. It's got people looking for legal commercial sex work, like uh, strippers and dominatrixes and stuff. It's also got the escorting forums, which are what everyone, you know, is talking about, which are obviously very, you know, uh, thinly veiled ads for prostitution, which is illegal. Uh, So that's, I think, what has people tripped up a lot because, you know, Backpage did a lot of things to say to try and keep people from directly advertising prostitution because that would be illegal so they ban certain words they say i mean they say you can't do this illegal stuff and they especially don't want underage people advertising on the site so they you know say you can't use words saying you're underage and all of that and somehow that the fact that they have prohibited these these illegal terms is now being used by all the people who are uh, who have been fighting against Backpage saying oh well they prohibited these terms because they were trying to covertly get these underage sex trafficking odds on there and not have anyone know it and i mean it's just it's so twisted because it they did what every other site does i mean every site out there twitter facebook any social media site it has certain, you know, things that you cannot post and in, in or or be banned. And so, I mean, that's kind of what Backpage did. And that's sort of what's drawn them a lot of criticism. Um, you know, obviously, on a massive marketplace where a lot of people are posting, a lot of adults are posting, sometimes, yes, sometimes ads posted by 
teenagers themselves or posted by traffickers or pimps for teenagers who are underage um, of consent did go through to pack page um like on i also read you know sex trafficking cases all the time and i see them you know being started on facebook or meeting their on snapchat and on instagram and just about every possible thing so it's not like that's unique to back page but because of the forum and because it wasn't a place for adult ads obviously more underage ads would get through there probably than than you know on facebook or something but the thing is also that Backpage cooperated with the authorities on this. Um, you know, they turned over information to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. They turned over information to state um, prosecutors and federal prosecutors and local police departments. They worked with local police departments and things like this. So, in you know, short of shutting down any open po- posting on the Internet, illegal things will get through. You want people to handle it like Backpage did. And somehow, though, just because they've been scapegoated, now we're going to have all of this advertising, especially the kind that is extra illegal. You know, I'm not just saying all, all, all sex work advertising is going to have to go underground. But the really bad guys, the ones that we're ostensibly really wanting to stop with this, are now going to not be posting on these sites like Backpage or Craigslist. They're going to be posting using encrypted apps or using the dark web and things like that or using sites based on foreign servers. And none of these people are going to cooperate with the authorities in, in any way like Backpage did. So. Um, so there was a interesting piece that ran on uh, the cut um, about the shutdown of Backpage and how that is going to affect sex workers and interviewing um, a dozen or so sex workers. Um, it's an interesting portal into the lives of these people that uh, you know kind of exist in, in the shadows. Um, and one of the, I mean, so they talk about how they're going to be forced to go out uh, onto the street, um, you, you know, using, using Backpage has helped them um, screen clients and uh, weed out ones who they think are unsavory or dangerous in some way. Um, there was a line that one of the sex workers said uh, that I thought was pretty interesting, uh, quote, the demand in the market for commercial sex is never going to stop. Um, and you, so, since you mentioned that this back page emerged after a crackdown on Craigslist, where do you see this going? There's, you know, this woman is right. She's got to continue to want to be uh, people who want to pay someone to have sex with them. Um, how is, how do you think the market is going to adapt? Yeah. I mean, that's what's so the craziest thing about all of, all of the people who are trying to pass this law, because they, they often say like, well, we'll get rid of Backpage and then there'll be no more sex trafficking. And it's like, do you have any like concept of how reality works? Like things don't just, someone's going to commit a crime. They're not just like, well, this one small venue for it went away. Like now I guess I'll just be a good person and abide all the laws and not like exploit teenagers, you know, like it's not going to happen. So I think, yeah, I mean, um, I, I think that people will, uh, some people will be back out on the streets more. Um, I think that, sex workers who are, you know, I know a lot of sex workers who are independent and, you know, are the kind that are on Twitter and are talking about sex worker rights all the time and stuff. And they've been very proactive about trying to spread the word amongst all sorts of sex worker communities, especially those who might not have, you know, this resources and be paying attention about new sites that are based on foreign servers where they can advertise so that, you know, um, or, or encrypted sites and encrypted email sites. And there's been new ones popping up. There's a Mastodon, which is this company that uses open source sort of uh, software that is a lot like Twitter. It just launched Twitter, sex work Twitter, uh, uh, play on that. I mean, mm-hmm. I guess I shouldn't say that because it's not actually affiliated with Twitter. But um, <laughs> And so they're trying to get a lot of people there. So there's already a lot of new sites that are cropping up to help with the the, the consensual adult sex workers who are, who are being hurt by this. Um, and that's, you know, I think that's going to be, we'll see even more of that because a lot of, like, so much of technology has advanced through through porn or sex work in some capacity. I mean, you know, the old adage, like, the internet was developed because of porn. So I think, you know, we do see so much innovation because of this sort of stuff, and we will see it. Um, this, the, you know, the tragedy is that, like you said, in the in the interim right now, you know, as people are trying to find where to go, there's not clients on all these new, you know, sites yet either because they have to move the customer base somewhere too. And so in the interim, I mean, I've, I've heard from, a lot, from sex workers that I know or from people on social media um, that people who went started advertising on Backpage and got to leave their pimps because they were able to post ads for themselves for the first time have been now hearing from from old pimps again because they're like, hey, you don't have any clients. I can I can get them for you. Um, I've, I've been hearing, you know, yeah, people already going out on the streets and stuff again. Um, and so it's just you're already going to see all these disastrous consequences for, you know, individuals lives. 
And I think that FOSTA, even there's a good chance that the law will be struck down or at least major portions of it will be found unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, and a lot of constitutional scholars have said this too, but again, you know, we're already seeing, we're already seeing detrimental effects on individual lives. We're already seeing sites shut down and have this major chilling effect on internet speech. So I think that even if it gets struck down, a lot of damage is already going to be done. Yeah. And and Craigslist closed down their entire personals. Um, you, uh, section um, you wrote about this in the Daily Beast, uh, which you know, so the I mean, is it like misconnections? Is, are, is misconnections no more? <laughs> yeah. Misconnections is no more. Uh, the casual encounters section is no more. Which when I was in living in Brooklyn in the the mid oos, uh, man, that was like all the all the hotness for <laughs> for finding people. Um, so yeah, uh, Craigslist shut down its its entire personal section. So any of the dating or things. Um, we've seen a lot of sites that operate internationally block access from U.S. servers already. Um, sites that are either sex or specific ad forums or just general classified ad forums. Uh, sex uh, Craigslist also got rid of its therapeutic services section, which is where like masseuses and Reiki practitioners and various holistic things advertise. Oh, wow. um, what, 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 could be, what could be less fan. offensive than a Reiki practitioner? They're literally doing nothing like whatsoever. <laughs> but, but, you know, but, that, but this is the thing. There's such huge, huge, huge penalties if sites violate this. And I think so many of them are worried that if they provide even the slightest forum where where someone might advertise sex, then they're going to be in trouble. So, I mean, Craigslist, when they banned their, when they banned their adult section, everybody just, all the sex advertising just moved into the personal section. Um, same thing. So, I mean, you're just, you, you're going to see that people are going to advertise new sections. So unless they're going to shut down like everything, but pretty soon Craigslist is going to be like two sections, like dog sitting and <laughs> computer jobs. Or something. I don't know. Yeah. I remind <laughs> what you're describing is like, um, what um, uh, Ian Malcolm says in Jurassic Park, you know, life finds a way. Like people who want to have sex, <laughs> will we'll find a way to to somehow somehow do it. Um, so you were uh, on the Laura Ingram show um, a couple days ago, and the appearance, which I just watched a part of that you posted on Twitter, was kind of contentious. Uh, it was her first. It was her first time back. She went. So she got. She insulted this guy, this young man, David Hogg, who was one of the students at uh, Stoneman Douglas in Florida and he like urged a boycott from her sponsors, like a bunch of sponsors dropped out and then she went on a supposedly pre-planned vacation. And there were some people thinking like, cause the same thing happened to Bill O'Reilly is that he, he went on a vacation and then he never came back. Uh, but she did come back triumphant and she uh, did, she did an episode in which you were one of the guests. Can you talk about what that experience was like? <laughs> it was, it was fun actually. Um, because you know, I've, I, the, the producer warned me before, and, you know, like, she's going to be opposed. And I was like, yes, I, I know. Um, I'm used to pretty much everyone I've talked to about this being, you know, I, I'm brought on as the, the opposition guest. But um, I don't know. I thought it was interesting because I'm in the green room, you know, getting my, my Fox News makeup done and uh, and then backstage waiting. And I'm watching her and I'm watching the segments before I go on. And they were all about uh, two things. The intolerant left and how they are shutting down speech and disinviting speakers and shouting people down and just, you know, they don't have any real arguments to say. So they just try to censor people and not let them talk or they just make up facts and and rely on stupid emotional arguments. That was half of it. And then the other part was all about how the FBI and the Justice Department are biased and they're thugs because they raided Michael Cohen's house that day. And, you know, they're prone to witch hunts and you can't trust them. And then we get on and it's like. She starts talking about Backpage and how, you know, the, the FBI and the Justice Department have gone after them and now they're shutting down all the speech. And I start making all the points I've just made here with with you sort of about how, you know, I don't think Backpage is the, the terrible person, uh, terrible monster. It's been made out to be it's scapegoated by the FBI and whatever. And what and and she just starts shouting me down and just goes, well, Elizabeth, look at them, look at them. And she she pulls up their mug shots and it's like, are you telling me these men want to help women? And, you know, I said, you know, it doesn't matter what they want. Like, but she's just like, they're ugly and they're old and look at them. Ugh. And she just straight up just like, and then I started to say again, she's like, let me talk. And so she just pretty much shouted me down and showed and talked about how ugly the back page owners were. And it was just like, every, I mean, it's, I, of course, of course, when it's liberal college kids, it's the biggest crisis to the First Amendment ever. When it's literally the government shutting down websites and seizing people based on uh, websites based on false premises and shutting down speech. It's like, yeah, but they were ugly, you know? So it was just, it was kind of shocking. Um, not shocking. It was just. Yeah, the cognitive dissonance. I mean, I don't know how she herself rec- reconciles that. But yeah, it was like, uh, it, it was 
uh, reaching absurdity levels. <laughs> um, is there anything else we should, we should hit, uh, on this topic before we close out? Um, I don't know, just that I hope, I hope people really are, I hope people who didn't know a lot about this topic before, if you are learning about it just for the first time now that you realize how important and how momentous this could be, and also try to stick up for people where you can, try to correct the misinformation, because I think, you know, um, oh, Mr. Smatisse is a dominatrix I am friends with and follow on Twitter, she's uh, great, she was saying, you know, sex workers are the canary in the speech coal mine, and I think that's very true, and people a lot of times don't pay attention to this because they think, oh, it's only ba about bad guys, it's about sex trafficking, or even if they don't think that, they think, oh, well, it's only going to, you know, hurt the speech of sex workers and people doing illegal things like prostitution, and they don't pay attention. And I mean, I hope that you care about everyone's speech, but if you don't, it's like, you should pay attention to this because it's going to get worse and it's going to come after you next, and this is, I think, a, a sign of that. So, yeah, I, I, that's, I, that's a, I recently had Sarah Jones of the New Republic on as a guest, and she wrote a piece about how pornography uh, is tied intimately to First Amendment uh, rights and jurisprudence and, yeah. uh, you know, key cases in the furtherance of uh, the First Amendment to have involved things that were considered, uh, you know, lewd or prurient or whatever in their age, uh, like the Comstock yeah. Act and all this all this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so... Uh, Hustler, Larry Flint, he got, you know, for, for showing interracial uh, romances. So. Right. And yeah. now, you know, everyone would not, I think, think that that was a bad thing, so... Yeah, for sure. Anyways, I think that the back page founders are, are going to be eventually, I mean, yeah, I think that they are fighting for free speech and sex worker safety and that they are fighting a good fight. Okay, well, thanks for coming on and uh, elucidating yeah, yeah. this t uh, confusing topic for us. Um, if people are interested in reading more of your work, where can they look? Uh, Reason.com or I'm on Twitter at E.N. Brown. Cool. And I'm on Twitter at R-A-C-W, A-R-Y-H-C-W. Uh, you know, you can subscribe to this show on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts, or you can also subscribe, um, on YouTube, um, leave a comment below if you have anything to say. Uh, thanks for watching and listening. Uh, Liz, thank you again for coming on and we'll see you next time. Thank you.